Merry Christmas to you all and welcome from the University of Lincoln. Uh, my name is Daniel Mills and I'm Professor of Veterinary Behavioural Medicine here at the University of Lincoln and it's my pleasure to chat to you today about trying to look at Christmas from a pet's perspective. A little bit about me and the work that I do. We run a behaviour service here at Lincoln to help people and their pets when they have problems in their relationship or with their pet's behaviour and one of the areas of research that I work in concerns you know trying to view things from an animal's perspective I'm going to bring in some of that as well as some other general hints and tips to hopefully make sure that your Christmas goes smoothly for you and uh, your pet as well so um, let's make a start shall we um, and I have to start by thanking everybody I um, put a message out to a number of friends saying do you have pictures of your pets I can use for this lecture and within a couple of hours I got more than uh, 200 pictures sent in from people so thank you to everybody who sent uh, pictures to and I'm not just going to talk about dogs I'm going to be talking about uh, other species as well so regardless of what pet you have you may want to um, it may be relevant and as I said pets play an important part in our lives and that's one of the areas that we also look at here. So not only do I have to thank the um, people who've provided me with pictures but also all the people who volunteer their pets to take part in the research that we do here and I have here a number of the um, pets of some of the clients that uh, we've worked with um, and that have helped us in some of the research. We do both applied research but also fundamental research to try to understand um, the way that animals view the world and how they feel about it. And we couldn't do it without your support. If you're listening to this in the Lincolnshire area and you might be interested in volunteering your pets, then there is a link here that you can sign up your pet. And it's not just, again, cats and dogs. We've got a database for horses and other pets and species as well. So if you're interested and you want to keep, be kept up to date with what we do, then please do sign up here. But the other thing about my research is that um, it also brings me into contact with a wide range of people and the picture in the bottom left of your screen is actually of a dog called Chaser and Chaser is a remarkable dog because um, he had documented an understanding of over a thousand words which is more than a lot of uh, young children have and his understanding of language has um, given us new insights into uh, understanding language more generally. And his owner was uh, a guy called uh, Professor Pilly in the States. And through an interest in his work, I, we have made contact with his daughter since he passed away and we keep in touch. And understanding people like this and uh, their animals can be invaluable. And, you know, I have a great job. Not only do people send me pictures of their pets, um, but as I said, I get to encounter lots of uh, great individuals um, who are doing similar work in other parts of the world as well. So my research, as I said, focuses on both the pure and the applied, so understanding emotion in animals, um, but also um, understanding behaviour problems. But I also work with colleagues from a wide range of disciplines, and that includes in the areas of business as well. And it's this is not a trivial subject. We might think about pets and think, oh, well, you know, they're, they're just sort of casual. And that has been the attitude. But increasingly, uh, not just in biology, but in other disciplines, people have started to appreciate just how important they are to us. We know that pets help people increase their independence, not just in assistance animals, but generally people feel more confident going out. They can be used in the classroom to improve educational um, achievements. Uh, pet owners generally report be better mental health in a variety of situations and also they tend to be more active and have better physical health. And working with colleagues here, um, we've looked at the economic impact of this because this is something that is perhaps not fully recognised, that how important this is to society. So just by looking at the um, physical health benefits, we estimate that pet ownership in the UK saves the NHS more than two and a half billion pounds. Now that's important, especially when we're at a time of financial crisis and um, economic crisis, that actually the pet ownership is helping us keep the economy floating um, and going. 
And there's a variety of ways that that works because people, because of the benefits that pets provide, they reduce use on community support services, um, reduce um, support services in schools, they can improve their functioning, people can be more effective, their mental health services and physical health services is reduced. And I said, if you just look at the physical health um, aspects and some of the mental health aspects relating to the NHS, the figure comes in at over two and a half billion pounds. But there's also indirect benefits because when people are better, they can do more for society. So they are more productive. So that also helps our economy. So this is not just, as I said, a frivolous part of time. Understanding pets is really important. And it's also important to appreciate that actually pets have been part of our society since we've had society. When the first humans settled into societies, they already had um, domestic dogs with them. So clearly there's something really important about um, pets in our lives. Now, I'm not saying that they were necessarily pets, the first dogs that were domesticated, but we've shared our lives with them. And we recognize that pets play a number of really important uh, roles for us. Um, they help improve our mood. Often, you know, just a dog looking happy at us can make us feel better. They can provide us with social support, which means we feel more confident in a social situation with them around us. They connect us with nature. There's an idea of what's known as biophilia, which means, which relates to the fact that humans have an intrinsic need to be close to nature. And if we live in urban areas, we can get divorced from that and that can put a strain on us. But by having pets in our lives, we remain connected and that might um, help us with our, our health as well. They help to create social norms and also build little communities around it. So if you go out riding or you walk your dog, you may go with uh, like minded people. And that can be really important for us as well. Uh, I've mentioned they increase the exercise um, and uh, they provide learning opportunities as well. Um, and as I say, social networks can be shared. So the bottom picture here, you know, people share pictures of their pets on their phones and that helps to build um, communities. It stops people feeling from lonely, being lonely. And just touching animals can be good for us as well. That need for physical touch. So all of these things can be quite important uh, when we start to think about the role that pets play to us. And it's not a question that they do one or other function. They actually fulfill many of these functions. Um, simultaneously for us and they often do it in a way that perhaps hasn't uh, been well appreciated and it's only now we're beginning to scratch the surface surface of this and we've done research at Lincoln looking at exactly what it means to own a dog when when people do surveys of pets and human health they often ask are you a dog owner well, as I said at the beginning a lot of my work is um, dealing with um, people with problem pets and I can tell you that just owning a dog isn't necessarily good for your health because if they're problem behaviors it can take a big toll. So what we've started to do is to start to tease out these different ideas as to how pets can help us in order to work out where the most important benefits are so that we can perhaps make better use of them within society and improve society uh, uh, as a as a result. So all of these things are important. And, you know, there's a growing recognition of the value of studying companion animals. And I've been very fortunate to have a career based around that. But I want to talk about Christmas. And we all know sort of Christmas is a great time of year. It's when Santa comes, we wrap up presents, we unwrap them, we put up the Christmas tree, we put up the Christmas lights. But it can also be exhausting and it may not be fun for all. So I'm going to go through a few aspects of Christmas and try and look at it from the pet's point of view. So let's look at the Christmas builder. What happens at Christmas? Well, there'll be changes in environment as we set up the tree and various other things. There will be changes to routine. We may do more or less exercise as we um, take time off from work and, or we have more visitors coming to the house. And some of these changes can be dangerous and some of them can be stressful for pets. And so one of the things that we do in our clinical work is we recommend that everybody sets up what's known as a safe haven for pets. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but just be aware that, you know, change can be stressful for your pet as well as for yourself. So what do we mean by a safe haven? Well, a safe haven is a place that we set up for the pet where they are in control and no harm will happen to them. 
Sometimes when an animal is scared, for example, by fireworks, it might run to the cupboard under the stairs, for example. This isn't a safe haven. This is somewhere the dog goes to hoping it will be safe. The difference between what I would call a bolt hole, where an animal runs to hoping it will be safe, compared to a safe haven is, a safe haven is somewhere where the dog or cat knows it will be safe. And there's several key features here. And it's easy to set up in advance. So I just want to quickly go through some of the advice so that your pet can go somewhere and take himself or herself off to that area um, and remain calm throughout the whole of the Christmas festivities. So usually we, we take something quite distinctive, like a new bed or blanket or something like that, and lay it down. And we lay it in an area that is secluded, that doesn't have any negative associations, but uh, the animal can freely get itself to. You might want to put a few treats there, but there are a few rules to follow. The first is um, you never force your animal into that space and you never lock it into that space. So they can remain in control of when they want to be there and when they don't want to be there. Uh, the second rule is you never impose yourself on that space. So you don't go up to the dog and put his lead on and take him for a walk. You ask him if he wants to go for a walk. And if he comes off the, the bed or the space, then you can go for a walk. But if he doesn't, he's saying to you, no, I don't fancy it today. And we have to respect that. The third rule is that everybody needs to understand those first two rules. So if there's young children, they have to follow those rules as well and they shouldn't be left unsupervised. People shouldn't impose um, themselves on uh, their dog um, or cat in that area. As I said, this is where the animal is in control and only ever good things happen in that space. So as I said, leave treats and toys for the dog or cat to find in that space, but don't go up to them and pet them because again, you're imposing yourself on that space. If you want to have a cuddle with them, ask them if they want to join you. And again, respect their decision. So it becomes a space where they are in control, they know no harm will happen to them, and they can communicate to, to you what they want and what they don't want. And these are all absolutely key in helping them see it as that safe haven. Um, it's a simple thing to set up, it doesn't take long, and there's time between now and Christmas for you to set up a safe haven in your pet if you can find a suitable location and a clear way to mark it. Um, for the animal. If you use something like a blanket, the beauty of that is if you've trained it to a safe haven, if you go to somebody else's house, you can lay the blanket in a quiet area and they can relax in that space too. So, uh, what about Christmas decorations? Well, we put up the tinsel, the Christmas lights, and have a nice Christmas fire. But these can be quite strange from a pet's perspective. Cats, their vision is particularly sensitive to movement. And so particularly things like tinsel or lights flickering can be really attractive to them. Um, this can get them into trouble. Um, not only might they pull things down, um, but they might start to chew on it. A lot of cats like to chew on wires and things like that. And you've got to make sure they don't get electrocuted. And you need to think carefully where you position these things. Uh, likewise, they may chew on the tinsel. If they see it as like a, a, the flicker, their brain sort of interprets it as if it's like an insect. We, often when animals hunt, we don't sort of actually picture the whole animal. They respond to very simple cues because they've got to act really quickly. Um, so they can take very superficial signs like shimmering light on tinsel as if there's something there and pounce on it. And as I said, they may well chew it. And I'm a vet as well as um, a research scientist. And, you know, sometimes you have to do surgery to uh, remove things like this in the stomach. So be careful where you put your tinsel and your Christmas lights. One of the things you can offer um, pets to chew on, which can be relatively safe, but don't overdo it, uh, is licorice sticks. And I don't mean the, the sweet candied ones. I mean the licorice root. You can buy it in sort of tradi traditional pet shops and also online. And that's OK for them to chew on. Um, and you can divert them to chew on things like that. The Christmas fire and the Yule log is another great tradition, but for many people, they don't have a fire much the rest of the year. So make sure you use something like a fire guard to protect your pet. Um, this year, we recently got a new cat and he's absolutely fascinated by a fire. I don't think um, he'd ever seen a fire before. He's a rescue cat. 
um, we have a wood burner and we have to keep him away from it because he would burn himself on the hot metal. Um, so just make sure that you have proper guards in place to keep your pet, pets safe um, if you're going to have a fire. Um, and especially if it's an open fire where sparks could flash out as well, because a cat might see a, um, a spark flash out of a fire and jump on it, same way as they sometimes do with uh, laser toys and things like that. That doesn't stop them getting burned on their paws or on their face. So just be careful with them. Another thing we often do at this time of year is we often um, bring in a number of uh, new plants into the home. So whether it be things like holly or mahonia, um, they can have sharp points and that can obviously damage uh, an animal's paws. We also have to be careful the number of the traditional Christmas plants like mistletoe and holly have poisonous berries. Um, so be careful if you're going to hang up holly um, and mistletoe, be careful where it is if it's got uh, berries um, and make sure that your pets can't get access to it. Other plants are themselves quite poisonous. So things like ivy, poinsettias, which are those uh, red and green plants you can see with the Labrador in this picture um, to his side. There's a poinsettia there. Lilies, um, whilst very beautiful, their pollen is highly toxic to cats. And if a cat brushes against the lily with the um, stamens in and then grooms itself, it can actually um, poison itself. So do be careful if you're going to give gifts of flowers to somebody who's um, got cats at home. Many florists now will actually remove the stamens for that reason. And cyclamens, another winter flower, is also quite uh, poisonous to pets as well. In general, I would recommend that you, if you're going to have a tree, because with all those decorations on, it's going to be fascinating, especially if you've got a cat or some other um, a bird in the house that flies or if you've got um, decorations that might smell interesting to a dog make sure that you secure your tree properly against a wall so it doesn't fall over and, and cause an accident be very careful about having glass or uh, decorations that can shatter or ones that are edible remember um, pets have an incredible sense of smell so even if it's well wrapped up in several layers they can still detect it and it might not be sort of when you're around but it might be when you're in bed that they decide they're going to go and investigate the Christmas tree and destroy things and as we'll see um, we've got to be careful with some of the foods as well so uh, not saying you know don't do these things what I'm saying is just be careful with them and be aware that there could be a risk there so let's look at the Christmas dinner. Um, a lot of people um, are not aware of some of the things that are toxic to pets. And the top picture, actually, there is a dog underneath the table. I don't know how clearly it comes out to you. But again, some very common foods can be quite highly toxic to pets. So grapes, raisins and sultanas can all carry a, a mold on them that can cause kidney failure um, in dogs. Macadamia nuts, um, again, can be highly toxic. Certain forms of chocolate, you can get pet chocolate and that's absolutely fine, but don't be tempted to give them a bit of, um, you know, some of your chocolate Santa that you've been given because you could end up um, with your pet at the vets or worse still, it, it could actually kill them if they get too much. If you're making things like sage and onion stuffing, um, and using shallots or um, other related um, plants, you've got to be careful because onions can be highly toxic um, to pets. They can cause the red blood cells to actually um, shatter and result in a form of anemia. Rosemary, um, sometimes used with lamb at Christmas and, and also with the turkey. Uh, lovely smelling herb, but again, can be toxic. Um, and also artificial sweeteners like xylitol, which is commonly used in low calorie products, again, can be highly toxic to many pets, as can some moldy cheeses like blue cheese. So these should not be given to your pets at all. Um, and uh, be, be wary of that. Remember, dogs evolved as scavengers. Almost certainly one of the things that brought dogs in close connection with humans was some of the sort of waste that they produced. In the early days of our relationship, you know, we didn't have dustmen collecting uh, the rubbish, but rubbish would be just chucked outside a, a village and the animals would tend to scavenge it. Well, in the same way, the dog will scavenge if it can smell something in the dustbin um, or if it's left unsupervised, it may well steal the carcass and the bones can cause problems. So 
just make sure you dispose of things very well. If you are unfortunate enough that your pet has a tummy upset, then you need to think very carefully about the reason for it. Is it that perhaps it's eaten too much or there's been a change in the diet or has it actually been poisoned? This is a time of year when many pets can get poisoned. So do check the ingredients of what they've eaten. And as a general rule, try to avoid giving human food to your pets over Christmas. It's the safest way to do it. And when we think about um, sort of the Christmas dinner, just bear in mind that our pet's view of the world is very different to ours. So in the pictures that I've just projected, the top one is a human view of walking into a room. We see the world with slightly different colors, um, but we also see it from a different height. If you look at that top picture, you can see on the corner of the table, there's a plate actually full of tomatoes. If you were a cat, your view would be quite different. Not only do the colors change, you'll notice how the pink feather on the toy has disappeared because um, cats don't see the red and so those sorts of colors get bleached out. Uh, cats are also much more sensitive to light and that's why their eyes um, shine when we shine a light on them. So everything appears much brighter. But you can see from a cat's perspective, they have no idea what's on the table. The only way for them to find out is to jump on the table. And that's why cats are so curious. They're often investigating what we can see, but they might not be able to see. Cats also love to investigate the way that things move. If you've ever seen a cat playing with prey, it's investigating and looking at the way that things move as a result of being prodded. And that can apply to ornaments as well. So be careful on that account as well. Um, there'll be Christmas parties. One of the things from our clinical work that we've started to think about is how difficult it is for pets and particularly dogs to understand raised voices. Um, we know from our own research and the research of others that dogs are very sensitive to the emotions and they use a whole variety of cues in order to understand the emotions of others. And they, they integrate this and they, dogs seem to read emotion more perhaps than somebody's intention. So how you're feeling. And this is one of the things that makes them such great companions. So if in a party there are raised voices, dogs find that very difficult to understand. Um, they, might, they can hear the intensity of the noise, but they may not pick up on the emotion of the situation. And this can cause tension for them and may result in a dispute. If there is a Christmas argument, then that can be particularly troubling because they will pick up on the angry tones, but the angry tones around them, but you're the person that they really love. And that can be really confusing. Um, and as I said, it can result in disturbances. It can result in uh, a dog, for example, biting one of the people involved in an argument or perhaps redirecting that aggression to one of the other animals in the home. So just be aware with raised voices, even if they're happy voices in a party, it may be very confusing and difficult for dogs to actually interpret. The other thing that goes with Christmas parties quite often are uh, party poppers, crackers and fireworks. Now in crackers, you may also have toys falling out and obviously a dog or a cat may pick up on that and, and chew it. And you've got to be careful in those situations as well to just make sure that um, they don't scavenge it. Um, um, so if something does fall on the floor out of a party hat, make sure you pick it up. You don't really want uh, to have a foreign body inside your dog's stomach later on. But many dogs and cats and horses as well, but the horses won't be in your home, will react to things like party poppers, crackers and fireworks. Um, so if there are fireworks going on in your area, make sure that your horse is safe and also your pets at home. In the home, as I said, if you're going to use party poppers or crackers and fireworks, just take note of your pet and how they respond. They may develop a worried look like this dog here. Um, and we need to make sure that they're um, safe and well. And this is where not only a safe haven can be useful, but also knowing how to respond to your pet appropriately. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a program that we've developed here at Lincoln called the Sensitive Carer. So the sensitive care approach is a program that we've developed to try and help people respond appropriately. When you read online about how to respond to an, um, a scared pet, then often you'll see a, various bits of advice which can be confusing. And I just want to go through this. As I said, the first thing to do is, if possible, make sure they have a safe haven or a quiet back room if you're going to a party. 
But if your pet is scared, and, and the, the ideas for this actually come from work in the human field on what makes um, a, a good carer for, in child development, and this has really important implications for not just dealing with an immediate um, fright, but also in, in the case of young animals, can really set the tone for the relationship. First thing I would say is don't tell your pet off for being scared. Don't say, oh, don't be so stupid, because your, your tone of voice indicates that you're angry. Now the pet has something to be scared of. Whenever this pop goes or these fireworks go off, not only do I find it scary, but my owner starts to get angry with me, and that will make matters worse. Likewise, you shouldn't try to console your pet. As I said earlier, one of the things that we've found is that dogs are particularly good at reading um, human emotion and human, and they, but they interpret it from a, uh, a dog's point of view, not a human point of view. So while you, you might be trying to reassure your pet by saying, you know, everything's all right, everything's okay, the dog will pick up on that emotion, that softness. And often when people try to console their pets, they snuggle up to them. Now, from a dog's point of view, what they see is a person speaking in a soft way, making themselves small. That's usually a sign that they're scared. So that doesn't give them much confidence. And whilst the owner thinks that they're helping their pet, they can actually be making matters worse. Because from the dog's point of view, not only did the bang scare them, but it also seemed to scare their owner. But the owner thinks they're actually helping their pet. Nor should you ignore your pet. Um, pretend nothing has happened. You'll sometimes say, see people say this, but that doesn't give the dog the social support that it needs. There's no recognition, if you ignore your pet, that um, there is a problem there. So the sensitive carer approach says you need to acknowledge your, your pet's concern. So you stop what you're doing if there's something scary and you turn towards your pet and you can you see that he's scared and you say, oh, what was that? You know, so you communicate with them. Making eye contact, dogs are particularly sensitive to um, eye contact and you, you're acknowledging that uh, they were scared. But if you say it in that upbeat tone, sort of what was that, that sort of thing, then you've acknowledged them, but you're also starting to show that there is nothing to be worried about. Now, sometimes people say, oh, try and get your pet to play. But if a dog is scared, the last thing he wants is a toy shoved in his face. What we have to do is we have to show through our own behavior that everything is safe and the dog will read that emotion and then choose to engage. And that's how we change the mood. So, for example, we might suggest that um, in this situation that you get you have some of the dog's toys and you start to play with the toys. You look at the toys. You don't look at the dog. You, you start to take, let's say, two or three toys and you practice your juggling. And hopefully you're a bad juggler. So you drop them. Um, and people in the house might have a laugh at your inability to juggle, but there becomes this much more positive environment. And that tells the animal that actually this is a safe place to be. You have acknowledged that they're scared, but you're showing through your behavior that everything is safe and there's nothing to be worried about. So your pet changes their own mood and you can reward that. So when they then choose to come to you because they can see that you're having fun, that's where you pause, acknowledge them again and say, oh, you want to play with me? That's great. And you play with them a little bit. And that way you can help them get over the fear in that situation. So, you know, some of the research that we do is taken from the human um, side of things as well. Um, we can use humans as models for better understanding our pets as well. What about Christmas presents and games? Well, be careful of um, some of the wrappings. Um, sometimes, you know, paper wrapping isn't really going to um, harm a dog, but um, some of the wrappings can get stuck, in, especially if they eat too much. So wrapping and unwrapping can be fun, but make sure they don't eat too much of it. And be careful of things like strings and ribbons because they can be swallowed and they can cause the gut to actually concertina up and cause quite serious problems, especially if they've got like a bow at one end. And that gets caught and that can cause a very serious uh, problem in the uh, animal's gut later on. But, you know, Christmas gifts can be a great opportunity for providing enrichment. They should be appropriate. So if you've got rabbits, give them carrots. Um, that's much better. Uh, if you want to give your dogs chocolates, make sure it's proper pet chocolate that you're giving them. But you can also make the whole unwrapping process an enrichment. Um, if you see that the dogs in the second picture, uh, from the left in this um, slide, 
then these dogs are all on weight. They've all been trained to, and they, they'll be instructed to go to individual um, presents that they can unwrap. Each one has a special gift for the dog. So you can use it as a training exercise and providing enrichment uh, for them. And it will strengthen your relationship. So it can be a lot of fun, um, great opportunities um, for them. One thing to be very wary of is if you're going to have a snow globe in the house. Actually, after I announced that I was um, going to be doing this lecture and I asked um, my friends if they had any pictures, one of them contacted me and sent me a link to a very sad story of somebody whose two dogs died because one of them knocked off a snow globe um, off the shelf and they licked up the liquid. Um, snow globes, the liquid that is in them quite often is a form of antifreeze and antifreeze is very, very toxic. If by any chance your dog does get hold of something like a snow globe and the liquid in it, um, or hold of antifreeze, and we'll come back to that in the next slide, please get them to the vet immediately. If you leave it a day, it's probably too late and they may well die. So do be very, very careful. Um, so beware of those situations. Uh, other liquids in some other toys might also use antifreeze as well. So just be cautious on that basis. So the Christmas weather, well, um, you don't need me to tell you that it's it can be cold at Christmas. Uh, I'm sure you're all uh, in a cold snap as well. But we need to be sensitive to how our pets see it. Yes, um, dogs can cope with very low temperatures, but sometimes um, the way that we've bred them and the, the way that they are, it can be difficult for them. And likewise for cats, they may not want to go out. So if you've got a cat that normally goes out, it might be that in the cold weather, he doesn't want to go out as much. And you need to make sure then that his litter box is cleaned more often because otherwise he might start going in the house because he's already peed once in his litter box and he doesn't want to use it a second time. So in the cold weather, make sure you clean things like the litter boxes um, more frequently um, to make sure that it's always clean for your pet. If you're going to... Uh, do something about the ice on your paths. It's much better to use grit rather than just plain salt because plain salt, if an animal has a small cut in its pads, can be very, very painful. Um, yes, grit can um, wear their pads down. Um, if you walk them on lots of grit for long periods of time, a little bit of grit on your path should be absolutely fine. And it's better to work that in than to use salt. And if you've got an animal with long hair between his toes, um, and particularly a dog, and you're intending to walk him across a snowy field, it's useful to cut the hair between the toes because that can, um, the snow can get caught between the pads and onto the um, hair on the toes and form like ice balls. And that can make them very, very sore. And needless to say, be careful of frozen lakes and ponds. Um, as I said, we've had a sad reminder of that recently with uh, the children um, playing on a, a lake last weekend. So, the same goes with your pets. They may be that much lighter, but they could still break through a frozen lake or pond to so keep them away from it. And if you're using antifreeze on anything, so for example, your car to get it started in the morning, please make sure that you put the antifreeze away somewhere safe. Um, and likewise, don't dose your car with so much antifreeze that it just pulls off and, and lies on the ground uh, where your pet could lick it up. If it some does drip off uh, any reasonable amount, then make sure that you uh, remove it with a cloth, wipe it up, because as I said, it is very toxic. It's, it's very sweet, and, and although cats can't taste the sweetness, they still seem to be attracted to it. It's the difference between cats and humans. They don't have much sense of, of sweetness because they're what we call obligate carnivores. They have to eat meat, and sweetness isn't an important quality. And so that's why they're different. They have a different view of the world um they have different senses according to their natural lifestyle and I said meat is not something that we would tend to think of as being sweet um so not surprisingly they don't have a good sense that for that taste same way as they see different colors to us as well so what do we do you know none if things don't quite go to plan. Well, we have to remember that none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. 
and it's important not to just blame the pet. There is some fascinating work that has been done on looking at pets and the guilty look. And if you look particularly at the, the dog in the middle here, this is a sort of classic, what's known as guilty look. Um, and this was not done at Lincoln. This was done by colleagues in the US. And what they did is they looked at um, whether the dogs, how the dogs responded after uh, in, in an experiment in response to the uh, owner's behavior. So in short, they told owners that they were testing their dog's ability to resist a treat. And they asked the owners to leave the room and they said they were going to put a treat on the table and see if their dog could resist taking the treat. Now, the neat thing here is what they did is they did the same for all of the dogs. All the dogs were given the treat, um, but the owners were given different information. Some of the owners were told, your dog did really well. He resisted the treat. Uh, other owners were told, you know, as soon as he we put the treat down, he just nicked it, he ate it straight away. As I said, all the dogs did exactly the same thing. However, the owners have been given different information. And when they came back, having been told, then those owners who had been told that their dog had not been able to resist the treat were much more likely to show the guilty look. And said, it's not because the dogs had done anything different. It was because the person's body language had changed. They were perhaps either embarrassed or annoyed with their dog for failing the test. And, you know, may, if they spoke to the dog, their tone of voice could give cues, but just their body language started to signal this is not right. And this gesture of a dog is actually a way of saying, I don't want I don't want to get a dispute. I don't want any harm. But if you go up to a dog that is showing this sort of look and you punish him, then actually you're making matters worse. He's right to show that. He's trying to break it off. And worse could happen in this sort of situation. If you don't read your pet's body language well, then um, he said, well, I'm trying to make peace with you and you don't understand that. And his only other option then is to perhaps growl or snap or worse um, to bite you in order to get you to back off. And this is not an uncommon situation that we might see in our clinic as well. People misreading the body language. We don't know whether or not dogs can feel guilty, but often what we interpret as the guilty look is our own body language um, and um, the dogs responding to that. Um, we've not really got any evidence that dogs can feel guilty about having done something wrong. So let's just remember that, as I said, we can all make mistakes and let's learn from it. If you left something out and your dog went and trashed it, that's your fault, not the dog's perhaps. Um, and just be grateful that he hasn't harmed himself. If you're interested in this, together with my colleague at the University of Lincoln, Helen Zulch, we've published a little book looking at uh, some of this, trying to help uh, people view things from their pet's perspective. It's called Helping Minds Meet. And perhaps that can be your New Year's resolution is to try and build a happy and healthier relationship with your pet. And I've got here eight tips from that book um, that I'm going to quickly go through now. First of all, is appreciate we have different ideas. You and your dog or your cat or your parrot, you see the world differently. Therefore, there should be limits to what we expect from one another. Um, we shouldn't expect an animal to be well behaved every minute. If we're not well behaved every minute, so why should we expect our pets to be? So we need to be forgiving um, and give them an opportunity to let off steam when it's safe to do so. We all make mistakes from time to time. We don't have to punish for it. We just have to pause and think what happened in that situation. And as I said, and quite often we have to ask ourselves, what do I learn from this? And that's one of the joys of having pets is that we're constantly learning from them. Um, as I said, we've got a new cat this year and I've learned so much. And although I've been working in this field for many years, um, I never cease to be amazed by what I learned from getting a new pet. The fourth thing to appreciate is that we speak different languages. As I said, dogs in particular are really tuned into human emotion, but they don't rationalize it and they don't think it through in a great way. They respond in a much more reflexive way um, to what they perceive around them. So as I gave examples, with example, the, um, the guilty look, uh, but also how to be a sensitive carer if your dog is scared, it's important to understand these things. And it's the sort of research we do here that helps in that situation. And remember, communication is a two-way process. That's one of the big advantages of something like the safe haven. 
it allows the pet to say to us, you know what, I want some space to myself um, away from you. And that's absolutely fine. You sometimes perhaps want space away from your pet. So, you know, don't force them to be with you if they don't want to be and recognize and read the, learn to read their body language so you can see what is going on. And in general, life is better if we can both learn to think before we act. Um, we might be very impulsive. And one of the things that we've um, developed at Lincoln in a number of protocols to try and reduce impulsivity in pets um, is teaching them self-control. And then they tend to make better decisions. Animals want the easy life that they can get, sharing it with their human. Likewise, ourselves, we need to not be too impulsive around our pets and think through, is that a good thing from our pet? Uh, from our pet's perspective, how would they feel about it? Not just think that they're little people. So, and we also both function better when we're less stressed. Christmas can be a great time, but it can also be a stress time. And don't be surprised if your pet picks up on changes in your stress levels as well. Your sweat changes and they can detect things like that uh, just from um, sweat, quite apart from all the changes in behavior. So give each other a little bit more room um, if needs be. One thing we can always do for a pet is to make sure that they've got that little bit more time to process things. And remember, there are lots of ways we can enjoy ourselves together, lots of new opportunities. So um, do look around for those opportunities, but make sure, especially with social media, that um, they are going to be good for your pet. I'll give you an example. In the case of cats, a lot of people like playing with laser toys with cats. We actually think that that increases frustration because there's never something physical for the cat to catch at the end of it. So whilst the cat might jump all over the, the place, um, we found that you know they also show signs of frustration unless you give them a physical toy at the end. So I'm not saying don't use laser toys, but if you do use a laser toy, make sure that you've got a little toy mouse or something to throw in for the cat to pounce and chew on at the end. And that allows it to reset. These are important things um, for their well-being as well. So because just because something interacts with it, that doesn't mean that it's enjoying it. You know, if somebody wrote me a really bad essay, I might feel like I want to screw it up. That doesn't mean I'm enjoying it. Um, but anyway, so there's lots of things to be wary of. So thank you for your attention. And I'd like to apologize to anybody who sent me pictures and I haven't included um, them in this talk. As I said, um, I really appreciated seeing them all. Um, and if you'd like to sign your pets up to get involved in the sort of research we do here, then the link is there. So thanks for your attention and I wish you a great Christmas. Thanks a lot. I'm not sure if there's any questions. Let me quickly look at the chat. Um, um, what sort of activity do you suggest to re uh, decrease impulsivity? The key thing is um, with impulse exercises um, is to make sure that the animal learns to control itself. If you're constantly giving instructions to your pet um, for um, to do something, then um, they don't they don't learn self control. They just learn to listen to you. So in those situations, um, you know, we we teach the animal that its own behaviour. So we don't ask it to settle before the door. But if we're going for a walk, for example, we might just wait until they've settled before we open the door. Don't just let them barge through. And you look at a range of situations like that. Um, so before you get out of the car. Um, waiting for food and factors like that. These all help to teach self-control in those situations rather than be waiting to be told to sit. Um, are there any other questions there? I'll just, um, I think um, that's, I think that's all of the questions. So, Thank you. Hmm. 
Um, question about dogs being yappy. Um, yes, some dogs are. Some dogs, um, Bezenjis, don't bark. Um, the key to understanding why they're being yappy is the key to the solution. So there's not one solution that solves it for all of them. And that's actually, you know, we have a master's program here where we teach people how, you know, um, to evaluate the behaviors because a dog may yap because it's excited in a positive way or because it's scared or because it's frustrated. Um, and we really need to identify what the underlying emotional state is and, and make sure that we, um, manage it in that situation accordingly so there's no simple solution to that but it does vary between breeds absolutely um but we shouldn't think that breed dictates so that the work that has been done um on um looking at how breed affects behavior breed is a very very poor predictor of behavior yes there are behavior tendencies but there's enormous variability uh, within a breed um so it's generally as I said, not uh, wise to sort of link behaviors directly to a breed. 